I'm your host, Ed Meisigland. I teach business owners how to build value and how to identify and remove risks in their businesses so that one day they can sell their business at maximum value when they want, how they want, whom they want. On today's show, I'm excited to welcome Dora Lutz of GivingSpring.com. Dora is the author of The Aspirational Business, owner of Giving Spring, and the creator of the course Business Planning for Social Entrepreneurs at Purdue University. From her earliest days of managing truck drivers through the creation of her second business, Dora has devoted her career to understanding the unique ways businesses can make a positive impact on society and helping leaders accomplish their biggest goals. Dora has worked with small businesses, fortunately, 100 companies, non-for-profits, and even the United Nations Impact 2030 program to leverage business models that create sustainable revenue sources and incredible social impact. Today, 80% of businesses don't sell. To be a part of the 20% that do, and at maximum value, you'll need a successful strategy. Welcome to the Defenders of Business Value podcast, where we interview today's top professional advisors who help business owners create, preserve, and most importantly, transfer value. If you want actionable tips that will increase your business value, stay tuned. The podcast starts now. Oh my gosh, you're so far above my podcast, but boy, welcome to the show, Dora. I am so glad to be here. And I was listening to that thinking, I really need to edit that bio. It is way, <laughs> it is way too much to say. No, you know what? It's not. It Everything that I would hope that uh, someone listening would, would see just the horsepower you're bringing to the show. So thank you. Well, I, I gave everybody, obviously, a little bit of uh, an overview of you. Did I omit anything or anything else you want to add from that bio? Or do you want me to just jump in? Yeah, no, you know, the only thing that I would add, because sometimes when that's such a long bio, what 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 tends to get missed is this idea that businesses that are for profit can make a positive difference in the world. And, and really, that's what businesses functioned. Uh, the functions are already intended to do. And so, you know, really, it doesn't matter what size organization you are. Really, what I'm all about is helping you figure out how you use those business functions to create the kind of impact you want in a way that also drives profit. And so I think that's the only piece that gets missed in that bio. I got it. Well, yeah. not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. So tell me, what is an aspirational business? Because a lot of the business owners that I talk to, their aspiration is I want to be in business next year. Tell me about the aspirational business as well as what is a social enterprise? Because we're hearing more and more about that. You do. And so really the, the difference is it's really just in definition. So when we talk about social enterprise, almost anybody you talk to will probably have their own flavor of what that means. Some people think it's a nonprofit that has earned revenue. So a nonprofit model that's that's finding a way to offset some of their donor requirements. Some people think it's a, a benefit corp or a B corp. Others think it's just a business that creates some kind of social impact. So I tend to err at the last definition. For me, a social enterprise is anything that has a, a sustainable revenue source and creates positive impact. That, to me, is the core definition of a social enterprise. Does the positive impact matter? Does it matter that I want my social impact to be for philanthropic purposes? I want my company to support my local church or the little league or, you know, pick whatever. Does it matter? I don't believe it does. Um, so, and that's what aspirational business, where that comes into play. Because what, what I believe is that any for-profit can solve a social purpose. Many of them are already positioned to do so. So whether you say, I'm creating a, an impact in the world that reduces poverty, or I'm creating an impact in the world that makes our cities more sustainable, I use the sustainable development goals as a guideline to help people think about what they want that impact to be. But for me, it doesn't matter what your impact is. And frankly, there's enough need in the world that we can all choose what's important to us and be able to move our businesses and society forward. So, so you come up with your cause or, and we'll get into how to frame this, but from a grassroots standpoint, does it start from the top down or from the bottom up? It could go either way. In my experience, the ones that do it best are the ones that have already had this baked into their lifeblood where the leader kind of has a sense of what they what they want to do. And, and they're coming to it with an intention to lead their organization towards something good. 
Now, if you are a leader who has, let's say, 100, 200 people already in your organization and you say, hey, I really want to start building in this aspirational business and you you come up with something that is meaningful to you as a CEO or a leader, but your people don't care about it that's not going to necessarily create the impact that you want right away. So if you can figure out where those pieces fall in the puzzle for what's important to you as a leader, what's important to your people, that's where you're going to have make the most impact quickly. So how do you get that buy-in? You know, like, for example, like Christmas is coming, the holidays are coming along. I shouldn't just isolate Christmas, but the holidays are coming along. One of the organizations that we support is the the villages. They're having toy drives and, and so on and so forth. And it, we have a collection of independent contractors and it's hard to rally the troops. You know, you don't want to make people feel guilty, but as a company, you know, we know how important it is to give back. How do you corral everybody to point them in the direction of, look, this isn't just this shouldn't be just my my thing. This is everybody's thing. And I can't imagine why you wouldn't have the buy in. You know what I mean? How do you do that? So let let me talk about the criteria for aspirational businesses first, because I think that will help lead into that conversation of how do you drive buy in? In my mind, an aspirational uh, business is different than a, a giving culture or a philanthropic initiative, which I think, which I would consider what you what you've described. And those are also really important. Those are those are great opportunities for businesses to give back to their community. But if we are an aspirational business, it generally means we're doing five things that create impact to society. So we have a vision of servanthood for who we are seeking to serve beyond just our customers. You have to serve your customers. That's just table stakes, right? If you don't serve your customers, you're not going to make it to next year anyway. So we can stop the conversation there. Uh, But who else are you serving and why? How can you prove that you are making progress towards the service you want to make? How do you create an environment where your employees thrive so that they're able to live their best lives? How do you meet all of your ethical and regulatory obligations? And then lastly, how do you tell the story of that within your organization? So if you've told a compelling vision about who you are as an organization and what you stand for and why it's important, then in my mind, the organization that you choose to support should be a natural extension of that vision. And that way, it's less of a it's less of an offshoot to say, well, we're going to support the Indianapolis Zoo because the CEO always secretly wanted to be a, a dolphin trainer, right? So we're going to, and, the, and your employees are like, well, that's great. I'm glad we can support the zoo. But like, I actually care about, you know, educating pre-K kids. So that's where I'd like to spend my time. If, if you're able to frame it within the strategy of the organization, it creates cohesion in a way that doesn't seem weird or irrelevant to, to your team. I know a lot of business owners will probably be wondering, you know, I have aspirations. I would love for my company to be more than just me. I would love to have a legacy. I would love all these things. How does the business owner get that aspirational vision? Like, can I really do this in a company? The, a lot of the business owners that, that I'm looking, you know, that we work with, I can assure you they're sitting there going, oh, my gosh, one more thing to add to my plate. So how, how do they do that? I do care about a lot, right? Well, I would, I would like to do that. And there's actually something called the, the five phases that the, I don't, I don't, we can, we can edit, <laughs> edit this part out if you want, but it's really interesting because really when we start talking about this aspirational vision, there are actually phases that CEOs go through to be able to get to the point of having these world changing businesses. So phase one looks like this. Uh, phase one is a CEO who says, yeah, someday I want to change the world, but right now I'm just trying to make payroll. So, you know, Dora, come back to me next year when I've got the payroll thing figured out, and maybe then we'll figure out what we're going to do. And then that's when they move to the second phase, which is what I think you described, which is, okay, I'm a leader. I figured out how to create wealth. What am I doing to give back to the community with this wealth that I've created? But there are phases that go beyond that. And that's where I think most people's definition ends. So if you move to phase three, then you're saying, okay, I figured out how to create wealth. I figured out how to give back to my community. Now, how am I extending that to my people so that they feel engaged and they feel inspired and purposeful at work? That is sort of the next level. Then from there, you move into the phase of, okay, well, Dora's doing great, but what about Dora's Dora's mom? How's she doing? You know, how are we going to take care of Dora's mom as she ages? And how do we build that in our communities? And then level five is, okay, how do we create 
everything for everybody. You don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to change the world and go build, you know, a $500 uh, $500 million company that's donating $2 million. That's just not, that's not the real reality of what most of us are facing. Right. Well, so on phase three, where the employees come in, if I'm an employee, I'm trying to envision this whole podcast thing that I've got going. And by the way, at the end of the day, business value is you know, a lot of the value is in the employees. Now is in phase three, is that too far down for the employee buy-in or in order to, because I'm looking at from a value standpoint, I'm like, all right, if you're now creating wealth, it's more of an investment, not a job anymore. Those employees up top really play contributed to is phase three too late because now they're, they're, um, I see what you're saying. So we may want to, you may, this, the, the phases might've taken us a little too far off from where you, where we want to go. I think most employees understand that the business develops through the eyes of the leader, right? And at some point the leader begins to abdicate some responsibility as the organization grows, right? So in the same way we, we delegate our essential functions, that's where the decision-making and some of the engagement with employees where that falls in. So I would put it right at that same phase of when you start building your operating systems and engaging different people, that's when you need to start bringing in additional opinions and perspectives about your community engagement plan. That's a great point because after all these episodes, business valuation keeps on coming down to can can I run myself out of my job and can I hire the best people possible? And so that segues right into what you were saying. So does it matter how big the company is for this to work? It doesn't. And I love that you asked that question because I had to think for a little bit about the right answer. Here's what I came out to after contemplating that, that if you only have two, two people in your organization, right, and you're trying to figure out how to build an aspirational business, it's more challenging because you have more hats to wear, right? You have to be thinking about what that vision is. You have to be able to prove that you're doing what you say. Uh, you have, I mean, you've only got a couple employees, so at least, you, you know, hopefully you're creating a great work life that you want for your employees. You, you lose less sleep, you know, over whether somebody might be make, making a bad decision and you have less of a story to tell to your employees. So it's a little easier as far as like, you have to do it all, but you have less to do. If you have more employees, and again, you have more heads, you have more bodies to bring into the equation, but you also have to do all that heavy lifting of communicating it, reiterating it, bringing that culture to life so that everybody believes it. I don't know that I would say one is easier than the other. I'd say they're they're different. Right. So for an, on how the business owner intensity of involvement. Correct. I got you. Correct. Okay. Yeah. One of the questions that I that I had for you was, you know, we, we talk about a story. Everybody has to buy into our corporate brand story. And it seems like since Don Miller came out with building a story brand, everybody is now on on that. Yes. And I think we're so good at authoring, we're not as good as being authentic. And so how does a business cut through all that noise? And really be an authentic business that you sit there and say, you know what? I want to be part of that. I want to be one of the the top places to work. So how do you do that? Yeah. So to me, that's where the, the beauty of measurement comes in. Because to your point, everybody has a story about the business that they want to be. But I believe that consumers and employees are looking more closely now to really look and see if that story is true. So not just authentic, like but is it actually evidence-based? Can you prove to me that you're doing what you say you're going to do? So the best example that I have of this, where things went south, and I believe your audience is about probably about the same age as me. So they will remember Dieselgate, right? When Volkswagen had the major issue with, with falsifying the emissions tests for their diesel engines. Up until that point, Volkswagen's whole story had been sustainable vehicles. And that was that was the brand. That was what it was built on. And when it came time for push to come to shove and for the engineers to figure out how they were going to meet their emissions standards on those diesel vehicles, instead of actually taking the time to do it right and, and fulfill that brand, 
they cheated, right? They figured out how to work the system. And that ultimately lost billions of dollars in valuation, in revenue, in just costs, right? They still have millions of cars sitting out in the middle of the desert with nowhere to go from the buyback from that program. If they had been measuring it, they would have realized, I believe, that we can't falsify this because if we don't, we're going to have to report on this down the road, right? This will come back and bite us. And, and I believe that consumers, because of those types of experiences, are looking for the data to show that you're doing what you say you're going to do. On the bigger businesses, how are the smaller businesses being vetted? Go to my Facebook page and or go look at Google reviews. And the longer I'm in this, the more... I hear of how people are cutting the corners that because you can make 50 Gmail accounts, you can backfill your reviews. So, I mean, how does a consumer, like I said, cut through that noise and say, you know what, this is, this is that company. I think it's based on performance. I, I think you can just tell just through your interaction, maybe the deliberateness on online and do you have any other ideas on that? I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm I think that's where that that fifth pillar of are you communicating your what you're doing effectively is important. But but still, even if you are a, a small business that doesn't have huge reporting structure behind you to talk about <laughs> okay. your emissions testing, I think people still want to see evidence that you are truly doing what you say you want to do. Over this year, obviously, diversity and inclusion has become a very important topic that a lot of people were not uh, were not really. Making be prepared, right, to show that they had done the work, many people started stepping up and saying, okay, we have to figure out how to address this. The ones who fared the best, in my opinion, were the ones who had already done enough that they could show that they had been making progress. And I believe that consumers and employees, they're not looking for perfection. They're looking for progress. They want to know that we as leaders are trying. They are not expecting perfection from us. I get it. No, that makes sense. If you're putting in the effort, no one, no one blames it. It's the, again, cutting corners and just going through the motions is not sufficient anymore. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think as leaders, we have to be looking far enough down the road to see what might be coming that we need to be addressing, right? That's Lawrence Fink's perspective with BlackRock and how they invest. Are you thinking long enough, long term enough in addressing social issues that you can avoid some of that risk? And if you're not, they won't invest. Well, speaking of risk, so business value is all about risk and reward. So, Absolutely. so I'm curious to know about does an aspirational business present less risk? And if so, that increases its value. Do you have, I mean, tell me about that. And is there any empirical evidence? Do you, are you aware of any of that? Well, so Lawrence Fink, BlackRock has a lot related to ESG. Um, and so if you if you follow any of, of Lawrence Fink and BlackRock's perspectives, what I love is he comes to it from a very hearty risk management background. He looks at this and says, if you don't do these certain things that you're not thinking long enough term and, and you're facing uh, sustainability risk or employee fraud risk, right, all of those different things. And partially because he lived through the bank collapse, right? He was on Wall Street when that happened. I come to it from the upside perspective, right? So we, he looks at it and says, well, you're avoiding risk. I look at it and say, and you're leveraging opportunity because it helps you innovate new products and services. It helps you access new markets. It reduces your costs of employee turnover, allows you to command premium pricing because you are deepening your customer loyalty. I look at it from a profitability standpoint where he looks at it more from a risk standpoint. But at the end of the day, it's kind of the same stuff. Well, right. I mean, if you're able to have a business that can do all that and to preserve your employees and minimize the flight risks, oh my gosh, I think that it certainly will help I'm thinking as we're we're talking, which is a bad idea, but <laughs> but um, I can see it. I'm just trying to quantify because, you know, but more productive workers create more profit. I can see it. So but that brings me to my next question of so how do you measure an aspirational business? You know, what are the KPIs for aspirational businesses? Yeah. So I actually have 18 criteria that I use. I will spare you. <laughs> I will spare you all 18, but I do have that assessment online uh, that if somebody wanted, they can go through and, and take that assessment. Essentially what I will do is I will, and I, I will tell you about the research that I've been working on for the last year. I took 50 companies from the S and P randomly. And this was basically all on a dare from one of my students at Purdue, right? Which is the beauty of being around 20 year olds is they're fearless and they think we should be too. So, you know, Hey, take your life's work and go, 
quantify it for me. All right, I'll go do that. And so I did, but I did, right? Challenge accepted. And uh, I took 50 companies from the S&P, randomly, uh, randomly selected them. And then I scored them all according to these 18 criteria based off of publicly available data. So I was just looking at annual reports. I was looking at public documentation, you know, the things that I could find. And then I scored them and then I ran the regression analysis. I found numbers that made me feel vindicated, which was good. But even I was surprised at how high the numbers were. So businesses that had positive aspirational scores outperformed those that had negative scores by 80% when it came to net income. That means they were creating, yes, 80% more in net income than those that, that had negative scores. Return on equity was a 30% swing. And then just so you, you ask uh, at one point in an earlier conversation, we were kicking around valuation. So I also created just two fake portfolios, right? I did a portfolio back test of a portfolio with positive scores and one with negative scores. And that actually had an annual return of 12% more when it came to market valuation. To me, that's all that's all goodwill. That's all brand goodwill, that that intangible, that's all, intangible that, goodwill that's all matters. Matter. Right. But the, but the net income and the return on equity, I mean, those are firm numbers. Right. 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 So I thought that was I thought that was really exciting to be able to say, we know it's good business. Now we can prove that it's a really good business. Yeah, that's that is so interesting. The strongly disagree is always a hard one on your oh, on, my on, assessment? on your assessment. That hurts. The strong you kind of disagree or do you strongly disagree? I just want you researchers to know. That OK, that, that, sorry. That, that, that those are hard to, to take. I understand. <laughs> I understand. I, yeah, well, you, you got to do it. So as we look at that, if I'm a small business that, you know, that and, and I get this blowback all the time. Well, you know what? That's pu- those are public companies. And I'm sitting here saying, you know what? It's just one less zero or two less zero. It can be done. Was there anything that was glaring? If you could pick one thing, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm going off script here, but any one thing that was like, you know what? That was, that was the common denominator for all these businesses. I love this question because I'm going to, I'm going to nerd out on the out. data here it's for my, a sec. Again, it's my podcast. It, okay. You can geek out all you want. Hit it. I love this. So what I thought was the most interesting. So I, I said I had 18 criteria and they were in five categories. When I looked at each of those individually, there was no correlation between any single one of those metrics and financial performance. It was not until you had all five together that it became an actual correlation. So what that means to me, and if you think about it, at the end of the day, this is nothing more than an operational excellence model. CEO sets the vision. CEO setting the vision alone does not drive financial performance. Financial or impact metrics, that would be the CFO. That alone does not drive financial performance. Everything with HR and creating an environment where your employees thrive, no financial correlation, operations, meeting all your regulatory and ethical obligation, no correlation, marketing and telling that story, no correlation. But when all five of those are working in tandem, that's where the financial returns happen. Yeah. I I mean, it makes total sense. I, I totally understand that. Now, when we look at the five, them having synergy between them, business valuation has, has little to do with revenue. I'm more interested in earnings. And so that plays exactly into that is that the entire unit collectively working with those five components, the synergy between them is what amplifies the value. I get it. Ab- absolutely. So one of the things that prompted this conversation was I wanted to know, can a business that aspirational business, can it be sold? And if it can be sold, can it be sold for more than say fair market value by just by virtue of, of it? And, and what's the likelihood that buyer, that the next buyer is going to be willing to take on the same aspirations of the previous owner. I mean, have you got any thought to that? I mean, or, or is there any evidence to that? Well, I think it comes back down to, again, the, the business fundamentals. So if you has, have an aspirational business where you've effectively built all the processes, you know that you've got something that people understand. You're, you're basically buying into a culture that's plug and play. Right. So people understand the vision. They understand what what the organization is seeking to do. They understand and they have the decision making tools to continue on. They have the employee loyalty, the customer loyalty, the ethical reputation. Now, 
I would say though, and I don't know this for sure, but my gut would be that if you were looking to buy an aspirational business and you were planning to shift the vision for how the organization was going to work in the world, that you would need to be prepared to make sure that you were effectively managing that change because that would be a shift, right? People have bought into this culture. So be like anything else, you'd need to make sure that you were, you were planning for that through an M&A like you would with everything else. So when I look at businesses, so when we're talking aspirational, define, I went down the road of philanthropic earlier, but that's not necessarily the same thing as what you're talking about, or it can be, I guess. It could be, yeah. Aspirational to me is you are seeking to serve somebody other than your customers. We are seeking to serve the the bare minimum, the bare minimum of a vision or mission statement that is acceptable in my mind would be we are we are seeking to produce X widgets at the lowest prop, you know, the, the best quality at the lowest price, right? That's like your basic standard template for a vision statement. If you can then think about how and why you're doing that, are you doing it to create great work-life balance for your employees? Are you doing it because your widget itself creates some positive impact in the world? Are you doing it so that you can create wealth and give back to the community? I think the why matters less than you, than as long as you define it. So as long as it's defined, it doesn't matter what it is. Oh, that's, you know, that's interesting because you hear everybody, you got to know your why. And I think it's different from what you're, what you're saying is that it's not so much as the why as it is collaboration is not the right word, but it, it, but it's along the same lines of everybody. There's buy-in on what we're doing. Right. It's the execution. You got to know your why, and then you have to execute on it. Right. It's like me saying, I want to lose weight. I'm not going to lose weight if I don't have a plan. Yeah. Right. So I might want to go change the world, but if I don't have a plan that people can follow, it's not going to (laughs) happen. Right. So do you know if ESOPs and for those on that haven't heard of the term uh, that's employee stock ownership plan is where the employees buy or own the company. Is there any, or have you heard of anything that, that those are better aspirational businesses than just individual S's and C's and LLC's? That's a really good question. The few that come to mind right off the top of my off of the top of my head tend to be higher performing because people are so engaged with the mission. I don't know that I have seen any that I would consider specifically aspirational businesses that are also ESOPs. Uh, American Waterworks might be the one exception. I'd have to go back and look and see if they are. Um, They were the second highest rated aspirational business that I scored. And I I think they may have an an ESOP program. Everybody's talking about EOS and KPIs and things like that. How do you deploy a framework to become an aspirational business? How do you do that? Yeah, thanks for asking. I think a lot of people want to make this work seem harder than it is. This is about incremental progress. So what I will say is you have to have the vision statement and some metrics that go along with it. You have to address all your employee uh, issues. So if you have something hanging out that you know is keeping you up at night, right? Or maybe you're you're concerned because you know you got this thing over here happening that might be a problem. You have to address all Mm. of those, all of those snakes under the rocks, right? right, right. You have to be willing to look at it. Uh, And once you address those, then you can start to think, all right, what's the next good thing that we could do? And it's a process of just continuing to grow and develop. You don't wake up one day and decide you're going to become an aspirational business. You wake up one day and you start taking progress towards becoming that business. And so it's working through those five criteria one by one and taking steps to improve your your business fundamentals. How long does it take? Well, that's a great question. I mean, the best companies, I think I've probably seen them move towards this in the in three years, but those are large sure. companies. So think about how much Nike has shifted from the days of having people picketing around diversity and inclusion initiatives right. to where they are now, right? That's a three-year shift for a huge global organization. So, it, you know, three years seems like a long time, but we're talking cultural shifts within Nike. I don't think it's that it's that crazy. Now, if you're making major talk, uh, major cultural changes, it might take you a little bit to get people on board with the fact that this is authentic. That yeah. you really mean it. I failed to even put this on on my sample questions, but I, I, how do people work with you? Tell me about your practice and what you do, and or and how do people work with you? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I have a, I have a lot of different a lot of different options. But the the simple at the end of the day, what I will do is help CEOs who say, I know that I want to consider stakeholder value. I know I want to build an aspirational business. I don't know where to start. I can help with coaching. So helping somebody figure out what that would look like. If the culture's already there and they just need to put a little oomph. Uh, towards helping their team get aligned, then I can do facilitated sessions and help them build those strategies. And if it's somebody like a newer startup organization that says, well, I want to do it, you know, my investment dollars are limited. I have a lot of online programs that somebody could go work through these curriculum by themselves. And just like EOS, uh, you can have somebody guide you or you can download the resources and you can just start to work through it. Well, you know, the funny thing, so many people I know that have done EOS are like, yeah, I need, I need somebody to help me implement. It's not, it's, the book was great. Implementation is not so great. It's, it's hard to get out of our own ways, right? That's why we hire sales coaches and, and life coaches to tell us when we're just, we're making this harder than it needs to be. Go do this. And and then we can move forward faster. Since we're coming up on our time, I've, I've got just a couple more questions. The first one is I always ask every guest that I have is if you could tell a business owner to do one thing that would change the value of their company or or make the greatest impact, what would it be? Mm -hmm. I would start to pay attention to the term stakeholder value. So this is becoming a new term that a lot of people are using. So this is what the business roundtable said that they were going to be paying attention to. KPMG's CEO survey said that 77% of CEOs are going to pay attention to this term. So a lot of people don't know what it means. So the term stakeholder means you're paying attention to everybody in your ecosystem. So pay attention to how you are treating your employees and creating an environment so that they can thrive. Think about how you are providing value and long-term relationships with your partners and suppliers. Think about how you are connecting and telling your story to your consumers. And then finally, think about what role you're holding in your community. If you're thinking about all of those groups, you're ultimately going to also create value for your shareholders. It's really funny you bring that up because I just saw a a new book called um, uh, Stakeholder Capitalism, I believe is the name of it. That's exactly exactly what you said. All right. So stakeholder. All right. Stakeholder value. All right. So now tell me where we can connect with you. And I will. And by the way, I put all of this in the show notes. So thank then, you. So, well, you too, but it's for, more for the audience so they can find you. <laughs> so you. all of this is, is on there. So how do we find you? Yep. So the, there are a few different ways that somebody could connect with me. First things first, if they go to giving-spring.com, that has a ton of blog posts, free resources. I've got a role that somebody could download right now that's free if they just want to start thinking about this for the end of the year. Um, And of course, that assessment that we talked about, and there's promo code defenders for for your audience to use if they want to go ahead and take that assessment. I will, uh, I'll go change the strongly disagree before the end of this. No, I don't want to. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. No, no, no. That, that, that's just me. It, you know, you, 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 you're sitting there looking at them, and you're like, "Golly, oh, do man, I I'm... do I agree? Do I strongly disagree?" Anyway. I understand. I understand. But so those are three ways. And then the other thing I would say is I I share a lot of contact on LinkedIn. So if somebody does want to connect or just follow me and see the content that I put up, I I share a lot of things that are happening just to keep people aware of trends. You know what? And and that's where I found you. And and I will be the first to say that that is an understatement. You provide so much out there and you are truly so generous with your information. And thank you. And you already mentioned the aspirational business assessment and the promo code defenders. I'll have a, a link to that in the show notes. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. It is. Well, been- I really appreciate you taking the time to to talk with me on this. And I, I do really, I really do believe that um, business can create a positive difference in the world. We can do so in a way that creates profit. It's just that I think most of us have been told that that's not true. Like we've sort of been told a lie and it is true that we can do both. Uh, and then we just need some direction on how to do it. Well, and, and since you're an educator, you know, you see it's it's never been easier to start a business. And to me, it's never been easier to start the right business and to have the backdrop of this is what I want to create for my gift to the universe. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I keep telling my daughters, I mean, I realize COVID is terrible. I get it. But boy, it is such a m- wonderful time to be alive, to see w- all the things that are 
are happening. And oh my gosh, I can't wait till I'm an old man to see what, what, what all our youth do, especially in entrepreneurship, you know? Oh man, you gave me goosebumps. I could not, I could not agree more. I mean, these students have more resources and awareness. We just need to give them the the final tools they need to build these businesses. I don't have to spend time with these students telling me, I don't have to convince them that this is a thing. I just have to show them how, right? And, and so if I can do that with existing CEOs, I think we are going to be able to move things so much faster together. Yeah, totally. Well, Dora, you know what? Thanks for being a defender of business value. I, sure I really appreciate it. it. Uh, Thank likewise. you so much. Right. Have a great holiday. Thanks so much. Thanks. This was another episode of the Defenders of Business Value podcast. For more episodes packed with strategies to increase the value of your business, visit DefendersOfBusinessValue.com for show notes, transcripts, and free tools to start you on your journey. Subscribe now so you don't miss any future episodes.